Thank you all very much for that warm welcome, and uh, I can thank my friends here at the Turquoise Center for bringing me here. Uh, this is the first time I've had a chance to come to Houston and see this beautiful place, which is wonderful, and uh, good to reconnect with Alp, my fellow editor and traveler, uh, so it's good to be here. Uh, especially to talk about this topic, reforming American views of Islam. Uh, as he mentioned, uh, I wrote a chapter in a book on this topic that was published late in 2008, actually really came out in early 2009, that was a series of articles or chapters on different aspects of Christian-Muslim relations written in honor of David Kerr, uh, Professor David Kerr uh, of Gull University in Sweden and, um, and other places. David and I traveled extensively through the Muslim world uh, in the 1990s studying Christian theological education in Muslim countries with a Pew Grant. Um, and so when he passed away, too young, I'm afraid, uh, was very happy to participate in this particular book honoring him. When I said American views of Islam, a view from the trenches, I really was referring to the fact that since I moved back to the United States in 1994, or excuse me, in 2004, <laughs> five years ago, five and a half years ago, uh, I have been very heavily involved in Muslim-Christian dialogue in Dallas. Um, also internationally um, as well. I attended a, the dialogue session in Madrid last year and in Beijing. Um, I've attended several Buddhist Muslim dialogues. I'm neither a Buddhist nor a Muslim, but I, I guess they look for an honest broker. Um, but it's particularly Dallas that I'm interested in because there I, I, through these dialogue sessions, have a good relationship with most of the mosques and know most of the imams in Dallas. And I have seen both how dialogue has worked and how it doesn't work, and how it can change the way Americans look at Islam and how it can fail to change the way Americans look at Islam. I should describe this dialogue very briefly. I teach a course every semester um, in world religions for our master's degree students at the Perkins School of Theology. And those students are required to be part of a dialogue group with another religion. So a group of students, typically I'll have 10 students. I'll divide them into two groups of five. Each group of five will meet with a group of five Muslim counterparts four or five times in a very structured set of dialogues. It's always different because the Muslims are different and my students are always different. And it's always very interesting at the end to get reports and learn what they learned from each other and what went on. And sometimes it's been very successful, most of the time. Ninety percent of the time it's been very successful. Um, I did have one group a year and a half ago uh, that went and visited um, with one of our imams, I won't say which, uh, outside of Dallas, and they came back and uh, I met with them to sort of debrief and they said they really do hate us and want to kill us, don't they? Um, so uh, I called one of my friends and said, I think we have a problem with imam so-and-so, and he said, D don't even ask. You know, there's freedom of religion in the United States, and that means there's freedom to be bad. That's, that's the case. So I want to talk about three different things that affect, in my view, American attitudes towards Islam and towards Muslims. And then I want to talk a little bit about what I see as some answers to reforming and changing those attitudes in a positive direction. I will close the latter half of my short talk will be by discussing some very specific issues that I think are the most critical points of difference um, and where the dialogue is most necessary. Now, of course, the, the chapter that I wrote in this book is, is quite long, as the editors reminded me several times, um, and so I'm not going to share that entire chapter with you. I'm going to really <coughs> give a press say. And a lot more could be said about this. You've seen a number of books uh, probably on this problem, the, uh, a nice book entitled Islamophobia. Uh, does a good job of documenting some of this. But I'll, I'll try to keep it simple, and that maybe will encourage a discussion. First, I think that there are three basic problems with American, or that affect American attitudes towards Islam and Muslims. Three. The first one is there is prejudice against Muslims, and particularly against Arab Muslims and Islam, that is based on culturally embedded understandings of Islam and Muslims that have been repeated in American culture for some long time. Okay? Uh, some of these are stereotypical images of Arabs as Muslims, and most Americans, when they think Islam, they think Arab. I know that 
for a group that's dominantly Turkish. That may seem strange. But it's very different, by the way. Um, I lived in Europe, in Vienna. Um, and uh, in Vienna, when people think Muslim, they think Turk. They don't think Arab. There are very few Arabs in Vienna. Uh, if you're in Spain, people think Moor. They think Moroccan. So the, it happens that the American bias tends to think of Muslim as Arab. And so any kind of prejudice against Arabs becomes prejudice against Islam and prejudice against Muslim. So that's one source. There are deep-seated cultural prejudices. And these are the kinds of things that are in any culture are repeated down the generations, caricatures of people, caricatures of religion. They go back a long way, and I don't, I don't want to explore all of them and how they're perpetuated in certain images. Um, in general, American political correctness has tried to purge American culture of strongly negative images of, for example, African Americans, Latino Americans. Um, it's no longer politically acceptable to draw terrible images of Roman Catholics as it once was in the United States. But up until today, the caricatures of Islam and Arab Muslims in particular remain acceptable in American political discourse. Political correctness hasn't corrected that. And so that, those perpetuate these kind of negative feelings. So prejudice is one. The second thing that has an effect, and we, we cannot deny it, is that there have been and there continue to be public attacks on America as a concept, on Christianity and on Judaism by Muslims who claim to represent Islam. Um, now, one does not have to look very far for such attacks. And one, in fact, can find such attacks um, widespread on the internet and from sometimes American Muslim organizations, or for example, this particular imam uh, who met with my students and told them in no uncertain terms what he thought of Americans, what he thought of Christians, <laughs> and why it was that Islam was destined to take over the country and destroy the infidels. He didn't leave a warm feeling with them. Now, he is not representative of the Muslim community in Dallas, which I know pretty well, but he claimed to be representative of Islam. And that's a problem. Okay, that's a problem. We simply have to face that. Um, now, related to that problem is one that we cannot solve here, but which I continually point out to my Christian audiences. Um, and that is that the Islamic voice that speaks of peace and dialogue often gets drowned out by this louder, more hateful voice and is often not carried. And this is just the fact that I can still speak to groups all the time, and I do, who say, yes, but if Muslims are against terrorism, why don't they speak out? And I go, well, they do speak out, but they don't get any coverage. You know, and we've seen this in the Dallas Morning News up in Dallas. You can write a thousand letters to the Dallas Morning News if you're writing from one of the mosques, and you might get one of them published. But there are certain regular columnists who will get their view on about Islam every week. Okay, so it's just a matter of, uh, in, in, a, in essence, unequal time. And it just, this simply makes it difficult for the Muslim community to have its voice heard. And I don't know if that's the same in Houston. It's certainly the case in Dallas. I think it's generally the case nationwide. I wish I could offer you a solution, okay? But I think the dialogue and the kind of things that this, this uh, group sponsors really are the solution, which is to say to continually interact with people and show them that the public face that they see is not the real thing. Okay. So that's the second thing. These public attacks that Americans hear about naturally have a negative impact on their, their attitude and understanding of Muslims and of Islam. The third thing that I want to mention, and here's where I'm going to focus my attention, is that there really are basic differences in worldview between most Muslims and most Westerners and most American Christians. There are some pretty basic differences in worldview. And I don't think they're incurable, but these basic differences in worldview really do result in a lot of persistent misunderstandings and miscommunications. And that's really the problem. People can have different worldviews and get along very, very well, as long as they are on the same page when they talk to each other about what they have in common. But if there's no awareness